We wanted to learn more about the people of the North, so we asked Sean to sit down with William Fitzhugh. He's the curator of archaeology and director of the Arctic Studies Center at the Smithsonian. I want to start by just talking about the Arctic as a whole. Let's talk about just the North American Arctic. How similar all these communities are as you start from Point Hope, Point Lay, and go across the North Slope and into Canada. Why are they all so similar? Well, first of all, they're, they're eating the same food. You know, uh, a lot of them are eating sea mammals, whales, the seals, and walrus especially, but fish, char, salmon, so on. So they have the same kind of lifestyle, a subsistence lifestyle. That, uh, so they have dogs still. A lot of these communities still operate on dogs, although they certainly have a lot of mechanized equipment, uh, you know, as well. And this goes all acro across from Bering Strait in Alaska all the way across Canada into Greenland. So, you know, some places are much more uh, diverse in the sense that they're more traditional, have father from sources of, uh, you know, uh, mainline economies from the south, and some people are still using kayaks mm -hmm. and, and dog sleds, you know, while other guys are using uh, snowmobiles and high-powered gear and communication equipment and all that. So, yeah, it's, a very, it's very interesting, and yet there is similar languages, similar customs, and I mentioned the similar food, and they have the same kind of problems that they face in how do they relate to the rest of us. The Arctic is changing uh, rapidly, yeah. warming twice as fast as any other place on Earth. In your research, what is it doing to all these areas? Different things in different places, uh, and part of that has to do with the infrastructure. For instance, in Alaska, you've got a lot of good infrastructure. Some areas in northern Canada, the villages are still pretty isolated, and, and same in Greenland. So. The weather is changing everything. The migrations of animals, the seasonality of appearances of these animals. We're working with narwhals now because the Smithsonian is going to do a big exhibit on the narwhal in the next couple of years. So we're working with the Inuit people up in northern Canada uh, on these animals. And their, their migrations have been changing too. <clears throat> As a result, some of these animals are getting caught in rapid freeze-up situations where they can't escape and they drown. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's everything. It's the, you know, not, it's not the temperature changes, it's the changes in the environments. Mm -hmm. Because if you can imagine the difference one degree Fahrenheit or centigrade makes in the world between water and ice, there you have it in a nutshell. You know, one thing that I did pick up on all our trips to the region, it seems the Arctic is one area on Earth that people are able to put countries are able to put aside their differences, the geopolitical concerns, and focus on the good because it's so important. And while so many people make so much about the rush to exploit resources, there's a lot of work going on in climate study. Virtually every nation seemingly has folks up there working. How is that impacting the region? Well, it's not that new. I mean, it's different because there's, it's coming with, you know, big ships and helicopters and all that kind of stuff. But the northern native people have been working with Westerners for a long, long time. In Siberia, it goes back to, you know, thousands of years. In North America, you know, really from the 1800s, you know. And in some places like northern Hudson Bay and northern Greenland, only since the 1920s. Huge time, time differentials. So they've been working with, you know, outsiders. They're used to, you know, instructing, helping, guiding, and so on. But what's changing now is that we're recognizing that we can't just apply science to this region. We've got to extract science with the native people as partners uh, in this stuff. Are you concerned about losing this culture pretty rapidly, if indeed as much development happens onshore and offshore? Uh, we're not going to lose the entire culture. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of strong native language particularly in Canada and Greenland. And in Alaska, there are programs that are starting to turn back the kind of wave of uh, English speaking, the schools requiring you only to speak English. That happened in the, even as recent as the 1940s and 50s. Right. Especially in Canada, some really horror yeah. stories. Yeah, but see, Canada now has got its own Inuit government in the North, and they're promoting their own languages, their own oral histories. They're, they're working with anthropologists and archaeologists to, to learn about their past in a joint, joint kind of way. So the cultures are changing, but it's not like a, you know, we're not going to replace their culture with Western culture. It just doesn't work. It's got to be a mesh, and there are going to be certain things that the native culture is, you know, understanding an environment. We're not going to understand that environment the way they can. That's why language is important, because language encodes all these differences. that We, we look out and we see a, a field of ice. They'll look out and say, there's 50 kinds of ice there, and they all have different significance. Great insight. Thanks so much for, for your time. You're welcome, Sean.